Okay, um, we're back to this, and we just moved up a step to obtaining board and congregational approval. Uh, this also is a, a bunch of the drone photographs that we got recently. So we ended up with a 57 kW solar PV system, 180 modules, and a 45 ton ground source geothermal system. So a system this big does require, and probably would require in most churches or religious groups, uh, approval by a consul, a vestry, a board, or whatever. And the same was here, uh, true here. In our process, we thought, I don't want to use the word diff was difficult, but it was not easy, that's for sure. Um, and half of the board had, I mean, half of the green team had been on the board before. So in that sense, we had some idea of what the board has to deal with and their issues. But to be quite frank, we did not um, develop a strategy for getting board approval. We just kind of jumped in, and like I said, the first time, um, it wasn't real pleasant because they said, we don't want to hear about any changes in the, the operating budget, et cetera. And we came in with a story that used a life cycle cost analysis and included what um, I guess most people call externalities. So in other words, when we priced out the the red or the pink column in there, um, not only did we include the price that we paid Excel Energy, but we included another column that showed the true cost, meaning the cost if you considered all the social impacts that fossil fuel has on society, and we pay it in different ways. We pay it through increased medical bills, we pay it in loss in productivity, we pay, in, pay it in, you know, a number of ways, uh, well, climate change, et cetera. And we have came across a paper by um, a fellow by the name of Paul Epstein, uh, Harvard Medical Center, and they put a group together to try to monetize what these social costs were. And basically, it tripled the price of electric. So instead of 10 or 12 cents a kilowatt hour, it was almost three times that if you put on the true cost. We showed that to the board, and they said, don't ever show that again. <laughs> <laughs> so we didn't do our homework well enough to understand our board. Uh, so I would suggest that um, you do that as part of your homework. Okay, uh, we've gone through this, what the board recommendations were. We found that uh, one of the things that was helpful was to advertise this energy system with sort of a uniqueness, a unique label, um, a positive label. So we used different terms at different times, and we think it was effective, but we called it 100% sustainable, Sometimes we called it zero greenhouse gas emission system or zero carbon uh, emission system, but it was something that they could kind of hang their hat on and feel a sense of pride. And one of the things that we kept trying to advertise and get out or keep out there was the idea that if we do make this transition, we can proudly say that we are still in we're still in the Paris Agreement because we've reduced our emissions to zero, essentially. So we're certainly in compliance. And we also felt that if we did that, that would be a good story for our youth, um, that we were looking out for their future and they could feel that, well, the adults are do doing something. I think it did, yeah. Uh, you have to understand the board, obviously, and we forgot that the board is only around for two or three year terms, and we forgot that their focus is on this year's budget. And as I mentioned before, there was a 40% or $40,000 deficit that they were worried about. So when the green team came in and said, hey, we've got this really great deal for you, 
over a 20-year period, you're going to save money. Well, they could sort of care less about what's going on 20 years from now. So anyway, you have to be kind of sensitive to this and educate them about the importance of a life cycle cost analysis. Because, you know, most of the board members weren't financial experts, so to speak. So I mentioned before that we had a lot of educational events, and um, that was important, we think, in raising awareness and consciousness so that when it came time for the board to vote, uh, they did approve it, and when it came time for the congregation to vote, they approved it unanimously. So um, I'll turn it over to Todd. So there was a lot of similarities to what he just Milt just talked about. Um, over communication uh, was key uh, because you know you get a small group of people, the green their green team or our team, and we believe that hey this is going to make the difference and all that. But when you get a diverse group of people with different backgrounds, educations, and what have you, and different concerns, um, it just takes time. So. Uh, our approach was we probably had three meetings with the, the council. We shared the options of which they've been talked about here. You know, CTS purchasing it outright. You know, I'm going through these really quickly. Third party purchasing it. We pay them. They do a recourse loan. And then we talked about the one that we really wanted them to pick, and that was the CTS investors and how it was good for the investors and good for the church. Um, and then we did pros and cons of each. Uh, and then we talked about why solar panels kind of like built, you know, what's the good reasons for it. And then at the same time, we, the facilities committee had been thinking, Hey, compact for us, it's 2010. If you guys remember, uh, that's when they were getting really popular. Hey, we can make savings in other ways. So we had started that already because, sure, the bulbs were more expensive back then, but we knew that would save us money in the long run. We started putting high-efficiency furnaces in. That was the big thing back then. So we told the council that, hey, we're on the path for this. We want to take the next step. So we had started stuff, and people were all in on that. You know, the bathrooms had sensors that when somebody walked in the bathroom, the light comes on, stays on for 15 minutes, then it goes off. So that was another key thing as well. We did the control system as well to manage our 25KW. And here's a similar chart that you guys have seen. You know, we've created the spreadsheet so that we know how many months we were in demand. We talked to them about that as well. And, you know, they'd come back with questions. And, you know, if we didn't have the answer, we go, hey, we'll get back to you on that. But we also had people that had solar panels, just this was an advantage, on the board that are using it and saw that their meter was turning backwards or they weren't paying as much as well. So that really, really helped as well. So I would say um, it was challenging, <laughs> but it was a necessary effort. It had to be done because you have to get the people on board. And then once we had them on board, it was done. So I talked about it probably from May until December, it took that long to get everything done, solar panels on, the investors working, and we turned the system on December 16, 2010. So it's, it's way worth it, I will say that again. I would do it all over again and again and again and again. That's all I have. <laughs> so I'm Pete Terpenning again from Community UCC in Boulder, and we um, did the solar project. And um, I don't know what I can add to the great things that have been said, and to the few and the proud that are still here. I, I want to try to offer a little bit of of something, and I, I think I wanted to come back to just the 
the idea that the that even risk taking individuals become conservative on church boards because they're because they want to protect the church and they want to protect investment and they feel a big responsibility. I think they, they think you know the church needs to grow in this day and age. You know we're all so many churches are struggling to stay a, alive. Is this going to help the church grow? Is this gonna, how we pay our bills? And you really just and it became obvious to me very early on and to John Graham, the fellow that was kind of the counterpart of these two guys in my church, who was in a CPA that was commit passionate about getting solar panels and um, really made a lot of our system work. And I'll, I'll tell you about, I'll, I'll remind you what that was, but um, these are not evil people on boards. <laughs> these are people that just want to do what's right for the church. And then, and, and we learned that we, we weren't going to get them to do any, but there wasn't going to be any money from the budget. It just was clear. I mean, we were struggling for money. So, so then I wanted to add, so I wanted to say that, um, so we're, we did this thing, if you recall, that I had said a little bit of earlier, where we sold solar panels to the people in the congregation. You know, the, the people bought them. They actually gave them money. And so it was not a loan. They didn't get it. They didn't make a profit on this themselves. They donated the money um, out of goodness of their hearts, in a sense, but not as much because you know maybe somebody just gave a hundred dollars, or somebody gave this little this little boy that gave twenty dollars or something out of his allowance, and then then but then we also did have two or three people that bought maybe three panels, you know, and so they put in quite a bit of money, and, and so and forget how many ours is a twelve kilowatt system. I forget how many panels. I, I should remember. You would think I would remember that it was such a traumatic, you know, it was like how many panels are we going to get to get there? But we made it. it. I think it really did help to have passionate people and a pastor who was passionate about it. That clearly, because I kept, you know, coming back to it. And so, and we build up to it with the fixing windows, light things. I like your light switch idea with the timer. I just wrote that down. I think that we need to keep working at this. Yeah, and then I think and knowing your people is important. So a more biblically based church, maybe a little more conservative church, I think in our we had some elements of that in our folks. It's really important to bring out the biblical imperatives, you know, and to and to bring it up in worship and to be preaching about it and to have Earth Sundays in um, you know, so to really emphasize the spiritual aspect of this. Maybe another church is going to be more focused on the social justice and on the and that sounds like universalist church for sure that you guys were um um trying to help them see how this really benefits the earth and, and that and that worked with us as well. I've been involved lately with the um, Unitarian Church in Boulder who has a person in sanctuary. And it's just interesting. I've been going over and being a night guard for them and helping out a little bit. And so I'm kind of observing and reading their bulletin boards as one does, you know, when you're sitting in a church for three hours um, guarding the door. Because, you know, they're worried, worried ice is going to come with the woman who's in sanctuary there. It was tough on the church. They lost their preschool. They've now replaced that preschool. The people were worried that someone was going to come with a gun, you know, and start shooting because they were angry at the church or something. So the preschool left. But they have gained like 50 new members. I mean, because they put their money where their mouth is. So the church is suddenly paying its bills. I mean, and I think that with a progressive church, it is possible to make that argument that you as a visible sign of action there are a lot of people in the progressive community who are pretty frustrated that they don't see a lot of action. You know, and here's a, a community that's actually doing something. And they say, you know, maybe, maybe I'll take my kids there. Maybe that's a good Sunday. Maybe they have a good, let's go list hear, hear the preacher. because I, And I really believe that helps. And, and it is a, a fact that in the United Church of Christ, the churches that are growing still tend to be churches that are progressive and that have are putting sticking their necks out and taking risks for social justice. It's hard to qualify, quantify that. It's hard to prove that. Um, but I do think this is a factor, that if you put solar panels in a visible place, there's a few people anyway that drive by and say, huh, oh, that's good. 
who are they? You know, and so that's a, I think that's something to think about. And what else did I, I think I don't think I have much more to add. I think, but knowing your people, it, it, as Milt was saying, it's very important going in. And it may be that all they care about is saving money. Well, then that's what you sell. That's what you do. You, you focus on that. You get, do this loan program. That's a really cool program. Um, but it, but it, that's not, not every church. Um, some are, are truly going to be progressively minded. So I, I think that's, that's really all I can add. But we can, if you have questions, we can think about that. <clears throat> Comment I will add is is even though there was some resistance with the board um, after we accomplished the build and everybody saw how beautiful it was everyone is now very proud of it taking credit um, they're advertising I don't know if you noticed on our electronic marquee that we're a green sanctuary um, it is it's been a big deal and very very positive you know in the end I think everybody's very happy with it. Yeah, we had a guy that was the most opposed, you know, you're never going to do this, make any, you're never going to save any money. But he became the biggest advocate, you know, taking people out and showing them the solar panel. <laughs> this is how much we're saving, and oh my God. Like suddenly he's an evangelist, and of course he fought me every inch of the way. Any questions? I wonder if uh, any of your congregations got involved in uh, discussions of our collective carbon debt to posterity as part of this uh, uh, educational process. Uh, just for some in the audience who may not be uh, uh, sort of conversant with this, as a middle class industrial country person, my carbon debt at my age is about $50,000. And the question is, how am I going to pay that? When and to whom? <laughs> Anyone want to take that one? <laughs> that would have been another reason we wouldn't have gotten thrown out. <laughs> so I, I have a sort of similar question. Mel, did you mention where you found the, cal the numbers to calculate the externalities by? Um, I'll have to get the reference for you, but the, the, the microphone. Microphone. Um, it, his name was Paul Epstein, and um, I don't have, yeah, I have the reference with me. I'll, I'll get it to you afterwards. Okay. Yeah, it's in the it's in the book. <laughs> if if you'll simply Google uh, social cost of carbon, sometimes uh, abbreviated SCC, uh, two or three federal government agencies have produced numbers. Uh, you know so much per ton, uh, they tend to be pretty conservative numbers, but you know, it's I think $35 uh, per ton was the last I remember seeing. Anything else, any other questions? All right, we're on, we're on the home stretch here. We have one more panel, um, which is implementation. Is that you, David? And then after that, we're going to just kind of wrap up with evaluations and feedback, anything you want to throw out. So um, I'll let Dave, David take it from here. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Thank you.